Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now expels them from the Holy Land. Because of this second facade, the killing of the prophets. But this time when he expelled them from the Holy Land, it was different from the first time. The first time they lived as one homogeneous community in Babylon. And they had prophets of Allah coming to them. But this time, they are scattered up, broken up into bits and pieces and scattered all over the world. He says so in Surah Al-A'raf. وَقَطْعَنَاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أُمَمْ and we broke them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. So Jews in Argentina and Jews in China and in Russia, maybe even in Australia. This was punishment from Allah, but Rabbi says no. Rabbi says this is the divine wisdom at work to allow the truth to reach all of mankind. <laughs> Having expelled them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now bans their return. Where does he say so? Waharamun. This is the only ayah of the Quran I ever recite word by word. The only one. Waharamun ala qaryatin ahlaknaha annahum La yarjoon. Hatta Ida Futihat Yajuju Wama Juj Wahum Min Kulli Hada bin Yan Sirun. Allah speaks about a Korea or a town which he destroyed, and the people were expelled. And having expelled them, he placed a ban on them. They could never return. They could come back as tourists. <laughs> but you cannot return to reclaim the town. Until? Until when? Until Allah brings down the barrier built by Zulkarnain. What happened? I'm not seeing your heads shaking. Until Allah brings down the barrier built by Zulkarnain. And Ya'juj and Ma'juj are now released. Hmm? When Ya'juj and Ma'juj are released, number one. Number two, وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ And when they spread out in all directions, which is your globalization, and they take control of the world. And of course, we know about Gog and Magog, Hadith al-Qudsi, I have created creatures of mind so powerful that none but I can destroy them. Even if we didn't have this Hadith in Sahih Muslim, Implicit in Surah Al-Kaf is the power, the indestructible power of Gog and Magog. It's there in Surah Al-Kaf. But Sahih Muslim gives it plain and clear. I have created creatures of mind so powerful that none but I can destroy them. So when they take over the world, they take control of the sea, they take control of the land, they take control of the air, it becomes the world order of Gog and Magog. They will now use that power and control over the world to bring Banu Israel back to the Holy Land, to reclaim the Holy Land. And you will see a state of Israel being restored into the Holy Land. Which town is this? Which Korea? Hmm? The method we have used is to go to the Prophet Muhammad Let him answer the question. So we go to the Ahadith on Gog and Magog. Yesterday, meaning 15 years ago, yesterday we'd have to spend three months to find all those Ahadiths. But today, with the Hadith CD, with the Hadith CD, in half a minute, and you have all the Ahadith on Gog and Magog, in nine books of Ahadith, 58. So now let's go through all of these ahadiths to find if Allah, Allah's messenger has ever mentioned any town connected with Gaga Magag. When we go through all 58 ahadiths, we find only one town mentioned. Only one. Connected with Gaga Magag. Which one is it? Jerusalem. Of course, not in English. In Arabic, Beitul Maqdis. 
And so we conclude. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا The Qarya is Jerusalem. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has now placed a ban on them. They can never return to reclaim that holy land. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is arhamur rahimin He now says to them, even though you have committed this most heinous of all crimes, this evil deed which, which surpasses every evil deed in history that you have done to the Messenger of Allah, still, still says Allah, Asa Rabbukum Ayyarhamakum. It is still possible that your Lord can have mercy on you. Still possible. What must Banu Israel do to earn Allah's mercy and forgiveness? The answer is at the end of Surah Al Araf. When that Nabi comes, who is and Nabi al Ummi. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. When we use the word Ummi, we understand someone who cannot read and cannot write, illiterate. But when the Jew uses the word Ummi, he doesn't mean that. Oh no. <laughs> he means the one who is not a Jew, a Gentile. And we will quote from Surah to Ali Imran to prove this point when we give the lecture on Islam and the international monetary system in Salah. When that Nabi comes who is a Nabi al-Ummi, the Prophet who will not be a Jew, he'll be a Gentile. If you accept him and believe in him and obey him and follow him and assist him and respect him, then Allah will have mercy on you. But if you do not, and if you return to the Holy Land with your facade, then mark it down clearly. We will return with our punishment. The first time around, it was a Babylonian army. The second time, it was a Roman army which threw them out of the Holy Land. And if you come back with your facade after 2,000 years, then we will return with the same punishment. But this time, it will be the army which follows Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so when the Prophet Muhammad arrived in Medina after the Hijrah, it was such a dramatic moment in history that it was as though time stood still. And all the heavens are watching. All the Anbiya are watching. What's going to happen? I mean, it was terrific drama when the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina. Because the cream of Jewish scholarship is here in Medina. Bismillah. When he arrived in Medina, he acted in such a way that would assist them to confirm that he was indeed a prophet of Allah. Why? What did he do? He followed their sharia. He did it even when they were not following their sharia. <laughs> Number one, their sharia gave the Jerusalem as the Qibla. So he prayed in the direction of that Qibla. Number two, their Sharia gave fasting, Saum, from, from sunset until sunset. No food, no drink, and the most difficult one of all for us, you, you had to stay away from your wives all through the night. That was difficult for some of us. 
<laughs> yes, it was difficult for some of us. And Allah says in the Quran, He says, I know what you are doing. <laughs> I know what you are doing. And now I've turned towards you mercifully. This there in Surah Al-Baqarah. So this was number two. He fasted with them on the days when they fasted. And in accordance with the rules of fasting in the Torah. But there's a third thing that he did which I did not recognize when I wrote the book. Only after I completed the book then I realized that there was a third thing. What was the third one? He enforced the law of the Sharia, for the punishment for adultery, which was stoning to death. They themselves were not enforcing that law. <laughs> and he revived the law, which they had abandoned. And when they questioned him on it, he said, bring the Torah. Go search in it, don't you find it? And they put their fingers on the ayah to block it off. That the Torah had prescribed stoning to death as a punishment for adultery. This was meant to impress upon Banu Israel that this is indeed a true prophet of Allah. After 17 months had passed, it was now plain and clear that Banu Israel had rejected Muhammad and rejected the Quran and were now conspiring to destroy Islam. At this moment, Asa Rabbukum Ayyarhamakum was closed. The door to mercy was closed to Banu Israel as an Ummah. Now Tilka Ummatun Qad Khalat. The door to mercy is closed to Banu Israel. Allah now introduces something called Naskh. مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِي بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا We do not cancel or abrogate any ayah, which would be a law-giving ayah, but that we replace it with that which is similar, or better. He didn't say different, did he? Did he? No, no, no. He didn't say different. He said similar or better. He didn't say different. So that which replaces must be either similar or better. Not different. So he now sends down Nasr. And that Qibla is now Mansukh. This is the new Qibla. He sends down revelation giving you a new law of fasting. So that law of fasting is now Mansukh. This is the new law of fasting. And now the surprise for you all. He now sends down revelation. It is at this time he sends down the revelation. It is at this time he sends it down. To change that law on the punishment for adultery. That law is now mansukh. This is the new law. And it is now a public flogging. Somehow or the other, we misread this situation. And we said for 1400 years that it is only for those who are unmarried that the law is now mansukh. But for those who are married, that law is still operational. The law of the Torah 
is still operational because the Prophet Muhammad did not enact this law. He did not bring this law into the world. He simply enforced the law of the Torah, which the Jews themselves were not enforcing. Is there anything from the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, anything at all, which says that the new law is applicable only to those who are unmarried? Did he say so? He did not. He did not. At the end of this period of revelation, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down revelation. And listen to what he says. Since the door to mercy is now closed, he says in Surah Al-A'raf, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَيَبْعَثَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ يَسُومُهُمْ سُوَ الْعَذَابِ Your Lord has now announced that He's now going to raise against them those who will inflict upon them until the last day the worst possible punishment. The worst possible punishment. Who are they? who are now raised against Banu Israel. The first, the Prophet والسلام, is asleep at the home of his wife Zainab anha, and he sees something in his sleep. This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. Do you know how many times? Eight times. Eight times. From four different companions of the Prophet. Alayhi salatu wasalam. What does he say? He woke up from his sleep. He has seen something in his sleep. It is terrible. And he wakes up and his face is all flushed red. And he says, Wailul lil Arab min sharrin qadik taraba. Woe unto the Arabs. Because they are the ones who are going to be targeted most of all. And I tell you, if you are an Arab today, you know what is fire. I can travel the world and preach, and I usually get visas. One of the reasons for it is because I am not Arab. If I had been Arab, it would have been a different kettle of fish altogether. Woe unto the Arabs, he said. Because of a great evil which will now come upon them, which is close by. And then he put his fingers like this and he said, today, mark the words, today, a hole has been made in the barrier built by Zulkarnain. And so Gog and Magog are now going to be released. The release of Gog and Magog commenced in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Who else is going to be raised against Banu Israel? Who will now inflict upon them until the last day the worst possible punishment? The Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a person. Not a system. No, no, no. A person. And endowed that person with awesome power and awesome versatility and a PhD in deception. Who is it? Dajjal. He's known as al masih dajjal Why? Because when he's released into the world, his mission is to impersonate the Messiah. Since the mission of the Messiah is to rule the world from Jerusalem, Dajjal, in order to successfully fulfill that mission of impersonating the Messiah, will also have to rule the world from Jerusalem. In order for him to do that, there is an elementary logical deduction. For him to convince the Jews that this is the real thing, that this is indeed the return of the golden age. Dajjal will, number one, have to liberate the Holy Land. 
of non-Jewish rule. He did that already in 1919 while we were either sleeping or eating halwa. <laughs> Number two, Dajjal will have to bring Banu Israel back to the Holy Land, not as tourists, but to reclaim the land as theirs. He did that already. Between 1919 and 1948, Banu Israel were allowed to return to the Holy Land. Prior to 1919, the Ottoman Islamic Empire prohibited the return of the Jews to the Holy Land in any capacity other than that as tourists. Number three, the Jal will have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and convince Banu Israel that this is the real thing. Of course it won't, it'll be an imposter. He's done that already. In 1948, that state of Israel was born while we were either sleeping or eating halwa. <laughs> Number four, Dajjal will have to cause that state of Israel to become the ruling state in all. And that is why George Bush has to attack Iraq. I'm not going to tell you anymore, you unravel that one. Let me see your intuitive intellect at work. What is the connection between an American attack on Iraq and Israel becoming the ruling state in the world? You do your homework now. When Israel becomes the ruling state in the world, and if you have doubts as to whether I'm saying it's true or not, you just wait. Just wait until Israel becomes the ruling state in the world. Just wait. When Israel becomes the ruling state in the world, then the Jews will be absolutely convinced that the golden age has come back. And we're now ruling the world once again. But that would be a one-eyed people. You and I, you and I would know that that is the most wondrous deception, the most magnificent deception that the world has ever witnessed in its entire history. When Banu Israel are absolutely convinced that the golden age has come again, that Judaism's claim to truth is now validated, and so Islam is false, and Christianity is false. And Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and Nabi Isa alayhi salam, they are false. After Israel has ruled the world for a certain period of time, then al Masih al-Dajjal will now appear in person. And he would rule the world from Jerusalem with what would appear to be the end of history, eternal rule. Hmm? The hadith pertaining to this is located in Sahih Muslim. It says that when Dajjal is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. One day like a year, one day like a month, one day like a week, and the rest of his days like your days. Last December, I explained this hadith to you. We don't have the time to do it one more time tonight, but you can read it in my book, which is downstairs. In fact, I consider this hadith to be so important that I took, I got my graphic artist in Kuala Lumpur, to design the cover of the book, Jerusalem in the Quran, using this hadith. One day like a year, and you'd see a circle, and in that circle you'd see the island of Britain. One day like a month, and you see in that circle the United States of America. And then one day like a week, and you'd see in that circle the state of Israel. And so, 
وإذ تأذن ربك ليبعثن عليهم إلى يوم القيامة من يسومهم سوء العذاب And your Lord has announced that he will now raise against Banu Israel those who will inflict upon Banu Israel until the last day the worst possible punishment. It's not only Gog and Magog, it is also Dajjal. And it is also Dabatul Ard. That beast that Arian Sharon is now riding. A very interesting event now takes place in Medina. Either shortly before or shortly after the incident of the dream. And Wailul Lil Arab. Eh? Indicating that Gog and Magog are now released. What is it? The Prophet والسلام, is now speaking a lot about Dajjal. He never spoke on this subject in Makkah. He never spoke on this subject for 17 months in Medina. But now after the change in Qibla, for the first time he's talking about the subject of Dajjal. All the ahadith on Dajjal are all from Medina. Post change of Qibla. Having spoken a lot about Dajjal, explaining to us a lot of things about Dajjal, he now says that he suspects a Jewish boy to be Dajjal, Ibn Sayyad. So he takes Omar radiallahu ta'ala anhu with him. And he goes to question the boy. But Ibn Sayyad is rather impertinent in his replies. And Omar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is furious. He says, oh messenger of Allah, give me permission. I cut off his head. <laughs> the Prophet said, no Omar. If he is Dajjal, you cannot kill him. And if he is not Dajjal, it would be sinful to kill him. Go search the hadith, you'll find it in my book downstairs. If he is Dajjal, you cannot kill him, indicates the possibility exists that he can be Dajjal. Are you with me? Don't go away, huh? If the possibility exists that he can be Dajjal, then that is only possible if Dajjal has been released. And so the release of Dajjal also takes place in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad Because Dajjal is released, and Gog and Magog are released, Qiyamah has now started in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad And this is why he said, Ana wal qiyama kahatain. I and qiyama are like these two fingers. Now you understand the hadith. Hmm? When was the body of Fir'aun discovered? At the end of the 19th century. When was the Zionist movement created? At the end of the 19th century. It is the Zionist movement which pioneers the return of the Jews to the Holy Land and the restoration of his state of Israel. But the Prophet spoke about ten signs of the last day. They are Dajjal, number two, Gog and Magog, number three, the son, the return of? The son of? Mary. Mary. Which, which Jesus coming back? The son of? Mary. You sure? The son of Maryam, eh? Well, then how could that fellow in Kadian say what he said? Have you no sense in your head? Is it only peanuts up there? And you're still defending him? And you're still defending the Ahmadis as good people? Do you have peanuts up there? Instead of brains? Will you not wake up? He said, 
It is the son of Mary who will come back. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad declared that the prophecy is fulfilled in him. But the son of Mary is coming back and he is the son of a Punjabi woman. <laughs> Have you got peanuts up there? We pray that Allah may guide them out of their misguidance. We pray that Allah may guide them out of their misguidance. And we offer them our book Jerusalem in the Quran as a guide that will help them out of their misguidance. The followers of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad and those who refused to declare he was a kafir. Number four. Because of number four, you had that conference in Johannesburg. Hmm? Number four is Dukhan, smoke. Number five, Dabatul Ard. Allah is speaking about Ard here. The Prophet ﷺ is speaking about Ard in the context of the last age. The signs of Qiyamah. And nine times out of ten when the word Ard is used in connection with the last age, it refers to Al-Ardul Muqaddasa. And so Dabbatul Ard is Dabbatul Ardul Muqaddasa. Hmm? A beast will emerge out of the Holy Land. It is plain for everybody to see except George Bush. Where, who is that beast which has emerged out of the Holy Land and is behaving like a wild beast to such an extent that even Jewish intellectuals now even Jewish intellectuals in Israel are now denouncing it and are warning the world of a tremendous catastrophe which is about to occur. I'm not the only one talking about it. Jewish intellectuals in the state of Israel are denouncing this beast, the state of Israel, in the hands of those who now want it to become the ruling state in the world. As soon as the body of Iran was discovered, the countdown has begun. When I was here last December, I said that September the 11th represents the opening rounds of what will eventually result in the state of Israel replacing the United States of America as the ruling state in the world. When Israel becomes the ruling state in the world, it is then that oppression will truly begin, particularly if you're an Arab, particularly if you're an Arab, yes. It is then that oppression will really begin. To use an African-American expression, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. If there are those who are coming to you and saying to you that the sunshine is about to come, the dark night is about to end, and Islam is going to become triumphant in the world tomorrow, they're misguiding you. No. The darkest part of the night still lies ahead. And I have come to give this message to you. How do you survive this darkest night which is still ahead of us? And how do you continue to participate in the jihad for the liberation of the Holy Land because that jihad has already started? We don't need any fatwa. Oh no. And no one can stop that jihad. No one can stop that jihad. That jihad is not going to end in any peace treaty in Oslo or in Madrid or in downtown Washington. No, no, no. That jihad will culminate when Dajjal is killed by the true Messiah, when Gog and Magog are killed. Destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then said the Prophet Islam, when you see the black flags coming from the direction of Khorasan, and Afghanistan is a part of Khorasan, go and join that army. Because no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. And so the British tried 
to colonize Afghanistan. And the British failed. And then the Russians tried, and the Russians failed. I guess who is trying now? <laughs> we honor and we respect Mullah Omar. We honor him and we respect him. Because all those other excellencies, rulers in the Muslim world, if they had been ordered by Uncle Sam to hand over Osama bin Laden, they would have handed him faster than Federal Express. <laughs> but Mullah Umar said no. And may Allah bless him. Mullah Umar said no. If he has committed this crime, give us the evidence. That was a very reasonable request. But Uncle Sam replied and said, no, we are not accustomed to this kind of response. We, Uncle Sam, when we say stand up, you stand up. When we say sit down, you sit down. <laughs> so Mullah Omar replied and said, we are Muslims and we don't treat our guests like that. So we honor him and we respect him for the integrity of his heart and for his matchless courage. He knew what his people were going to face. He said, when the Soviet Union attacked us, they took our cities and they took our airports. But they couldn't take the countryside. And we fought them from the mountains. And we fought them from the countryside. And it took us 12 years to throw the Soviet Union out. And so, Uncle Sam, the battle has just started in Afghanistan. It has just started. The day will come when Islam will throw the, Soviet, throw the United States out of Afghanistan. Yes. Which is why I have not returned to New York. No. I left the United States at the end of September last year. And since then, my address is a suitcase. I've constantly traveled. I have no home. None. If I go back to the United States and I speak the way I'm speaking now, they won't be able to stomach it. Not the Jews. And so I'd be imprisoned to silence me. Yes. So I am of more value to my people outside of the United States than in the United States. When that Muslim army defeats the United States in Afghanistan, even if it takes 25, 30, 40 years, it is that army which will be unstoppable. Unstoppable. When that army reaches the Holy Land, the Prophet spoke. This is the Hadith they don't want me to quote in Singapore, which is why the authorities in Singapore have now denied me permission to deliver public lectures in Singapore for the first time in 14 years. Listen to the hadith. They say it, it creates problems for their interfaith relations. The Prophet said, it is Sahih Bukhari, it is Sahih Muslim, it is Muttafaqun Ali. This is why I quote this hadith. There's another hadith in Sahih Muslim which is longer, but it is not Muttafaqun Ali, so I choose this one. He said, You will most certainly fight the Jews. And you will most certainly kill them. So you will be victorious. At that time, the stones will speak. Ya Muslim. There's a Jew hiding behind me. Fata'ala fuck. So come, come, come and kill him. These are the words of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. You can tell who are those who are faithful to him. Because they will have no fear to quote this hadith. You can tell who are those who are betraying the messenger of Allah. Because you will never hear them quoting this hadith. This is a litmus test. A Muslim army now liberates the Holy Land. The state of Israel is destroyed. Because Allah said, وَإِنْ عُدْتُمْ 
Udna. And so the warning of Allah has come to pass. And the Islamic State now replaces that imposter Israel. And that Islamic State will now become the ruling state in the world. The definition of a ruling state being a state which can impose its will on any rival. And Islam will rule the world from Jerusalem. The Messiah will rule the world from Jerusalem. And the promise communicated with Isaiah is now fulfilled. Imam al-Mahdi will live for seven years and then die. And this is my topic for a few days from now. Imam al-Mahdi and the return of the Khilafah. But Isa al will, will, will live for 40 years and then die. This is his mouth. Qabla mauti. He will get married, and as I told you, I hope it will be a Palestinian Muslim girl, inshallah. And he will have children. I told you the Pope doesn't know about that. And then he will die. And the Prophet said, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, that you will perform salatul janaza over his body. And he said that he'll be buried next to me in Medina. This has been Jerusalem in the Quran. You have more information in the Quran and in the Hadith than you need. An abundance of information in the Quran and the Hadith. Explaining to you today, so plainly and clearly, the world in which you live today. How do you respond to the awesome predicament of this moment? How do you respond? to the challenges of the world in which we live today. This is my topic entitled The Muslim Village, on which I spoke at Salatul Juma. I don't have the time, of course, tonight to come to this part of the lecture, how do we respond? But I plan to go to Cape Town, inshallah, just before Ramadan, and ask them to give me the day free of, free, no, no, nothing in the daytime. So after tar Taraweed, then we give a talk every night in a different masjid in Cape Town. So during the day, please make dua that they will not interrupt me. During the month of Ramadan, I hope I can write this booklet on the Muslim village as a response to the challenges of the age in which we live today. So that from that Muslim village will emerge the lions who will go and liberate the Holy Land. Downstairs you will find Jerusalem in the Quran. You are the first in Australia to get it. Downstairs you will also find the CD. The whole book there as an electronic book. There is an Egyptian brother in Kuala Lumpur. A lovely Muslim brother. Who lost his job. Married to a Malay girl. Has two lovely children. And lost his job for, for the whole of one year. Couldn't get a job. Sometimes he didn't even have milk for his children. So we got a grant and we gave it to him and said, take this money and go and produce this CD on Jerusalem in the Quran. And wherever there is a verse of the Quran in the book, you get it in audio as well. So he got a lovely Egyptian sheikh as a Qari to recite it. And we have the CD. And I said to him, I'll take this CD wherever I go in the world and put it on sale for you and the total sales will go to you, inshallah. So that CD is downstairs. I hope we can sell. I think we have about 200. I hope we can sell them all so I can take that money back to Kuala Lumpur and hand it to him. And finally, downstairs, you'll also find my teacher's book. This is the man who trained me and taught me that I could give this talk tonight. So may Allah bless him in his grave. Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah. Perhaps the best book on Islam ever written in the English language is his book, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society, in two volumes. And that book also is downstairs. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless this audience.